Hello, everyone. Music Scene Investigation is on the air. Rich Wildman here. Glad you're along with us. I have some interesting news. I don't know if it'll be good news, but it's definitely going to be interesting news. I think that uh, this week, pending pending what happens uh, during this show, will probably be the last live video you'll see from us in a while. Um, but we'll see how it goes. I'm not really sure what to say about it yet. Uh, looking over at things, everything looks okay right now. I did put a big, giant play button, as Ian calls it, a bloody big play button, on the uh, live playback page where you can grab the audio only if the video is giving you any problems. So there is that option as well. We'll still go ahead and record video. We'll still go ahead and post video out to YouTube, iTunes, the website, and so forth. It just you just won't be able to see it live. You'll hear the audio live, but not the video. It, but it, you will still get the chance to see our lovely faces. It, exactly, you will. So there is that going for us. I don't know what that means. We have faces made for radio anyway. That's all there is to that. I want to say hello to everyone out in the chat room, Pinky, Patty, Boxo, Crap, and everybody else out there. Glad that you're with us. As we get through and start things up this week, what we're going to do is we're going to find out who's on our panel, talk to everybody on the panel. We'll review three new songs submitted by indie artists from around the world, or at least our panel will. And, uh, of course, as always, if you want to submit music to Music Scene Investigation for the panel to review, go to musicsceneinvestigation.com, click on Submit a Song at the top of the page. It's just that easy. Let's go over to London, England, meet the man, the myth, the legend, the guy who has a T-shirt with his own picture on it, Mr. Ian Husbands. Hey, Ian. Not today you don't. You're right. Unless you're Batman, damn it. No, that's Tom. Okay. Just wondering. <laughs> <laughs> How are we doing? Doing fine. How are you? Yeah, yeah. It's it's been sunny here today, we, and actually quite warm. I'm I'm hearing through the grapevine of the meteorologists I know that that's about to end for you guys. Well, probably we've just had a Tory government voted in again, so the next five years are going to be uh, predicted to be grey, dark, and dingy. Well, it's just like my laundry. <laughs> But uh, there you go. We can compare David Cameron to Rich's soiled underwear. There you are. What color is his hair? Ah, brown. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> but you just insulted him for me. I don't need to take it any further, really. Well, there you are. I'm here to help any way I can because obviously he can't throw me in jail. I'm not a citizen of the crown. Indeed, uh, and uh, he can't throw me in jail because I'm allegedly allowed to have this thing called freedom of speech yeah. in this democratic world that we live in. Yeah, well, we'll talk about that later on another show, perhaps. But uh, right now, I want to know what you have for me in the way of witness statements from last week. Last week, as everybody will remember, we had uh, Fogelda on uh, the show with their track Trees along with Live Moni. And uh, Free World Illusion, and the song of the week was from Sucker Band, and it was called Circus. So uh, what about the witness statements, Ian? All right, well, not many people joined us. Oh, three people voted this week in the witness statement. Uh, we need more. Come on, guys, get it together and, uh, and vote in the witness statements at the end of the show. But no one agreed, really. Um <laughs> For example, best songwriting, song three, which was Circus by Sucker Band, who we voted Song of the Week, got 67% of the votes. That's two to everyone else. That's uh, still the uh, lead. With, with, with one vote going to song two. All right. Uh, on best performance, they all got 33.33333 reoccurring, uh, with one vote each. And on Best Mix and Production, it was exactly the same. They all got one vote each. So, yeah, no one really agreed this week. It, you know, the song one effectively wins because it got one vote extra in Best Songwriting. But um, it was a bit of a mixed bag. Of course, you understand that uh, any times that happens, you're supposed to say, oh, they agreed with us. The vote was overwhelmingly in our favor. Yeah, but I'm not, uh, I'm not a Tory. Oh, sorry about that. I'll give you some lessons in politics one of these days, okay? You should know me by now, Rich. I'm not very conservative. 
Yeah, I know. I know. Super, <laughs> super liberal. That's what you need is a shirt that says super liberal and then a cape I, on the back. No, I'm going to get two T-shirts made up soon. I'm going to get one saying I hate haters. Okay. And the other one saying I hate humans. Okay. Why don't you just get one shirt that, has, that says I hate hater humans? Nah, that doesn't quite work. I hate human haters? Two, two T-shirts for two occasions, you know, come on. Just get a shirt that out. says, I like potatoes and call it done. I might just get one saying, I hate. <laughs> that'll that'll work. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, it's good to see you, Ian, as always, even with a Batman shirt on. Uh, you're still looking fine. Da -na 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 little little gray in the beard I can see coming in, though. I just thought I'd throw that out there. Taking off to you, sir. Yeah, well, I'm just... Pointing it out. That's all I'm doing. Over in Lisa, Las Vegas. No, Lisa, don't die mine. <laughs> I don't die mine either. It is more gray now. If you go back a couple of years, you'll see it was not gray, hardly at all. And now uh, this is what you have to look forward to, Ian, I'm telling you. Three years of doing MSI with Tom, that is. I'm just telling you. Martin Waterhouse <laughs> joins us in the chat room. Hey, Martin, how are you, sir? In Las Vegas, guess who's here? It's Andrea Benzmiller. Hey, Andrea, how are you? I'm great. I'm great, Rich. It's good to see uh, you. You're a little pixelated for me today, but that's okay. We can still I, see hmm. your beauty coming through. Yeah, I don't know what's going on there. I don't have a whole lot happening on my end, so. It's all that Netflix. Maybe it's Mother's Day, you know, here, so. <laughs> that's true. It is Mother's Day. Maybe everybody's Skyping their mom. It could be. The uh, whole Skype system might be overwhelmed at the moment. Never know. So how are you? Are you having a great holiday? I'm good, yeah. I um, My mom has been struggling with her computer, and I, that means I've been struggling with her computer <laughs> for for months now. She keeps clicking on things that she shouldn't click on. Oh, yeah. So um, so my brother and I got her an iPad. Good move. And um, we're hoping to uh, save some of my life. From, yeah, from the endless hacking that mm. goes on with PCs. Yeah, I ran into the same thing a number of years ago, and uh, I went and purchased my mother one of those small laptops, you know, the netbooks. Yeah. In in hope uh -huh. in hope that that would take care of it, didn't do it. No. So uh, a couple of years after that, I like you bought her an iPad. Yeah, I figure there's not a whole lot you can do wrong, you know. Don't count on it. Uh, I bought my mum a Kindle. So, she thought it was a chopping board. <laughs> yeah, there's that. What is that show, that British show where the guy, he uh, was given an iPad and he sticks it in the dishwasher? Yeah. yeah. It was on some, <laughs> there was a YouTube video about a guy who did that too, yeah. Crazy stuff, crazy stuff. Uh, Andrea, how are things out in Vegas? Ian says it's nice and warm over in London, so I am assuming that based upon his weather report that it's blazing hot in Vegas. It's actually been kind of um, kind of moderate this week. Uh, Friday was a little bit cool. It was in the low 60s, which is uncommon right now. But, um, but yeah, it's getting warmer. I'm kind of hoping it, that goes slow because... There's nothing worse than the the blazing heat, you know, here. That's the one part of the year where it's just not that pleasant. So Yeah, it's very true. So we'll see. But everything is going, you know, Vegas is pretty much plugging along. There was a big to-do about um, Cirque du Soleil being sold. I don't know if you guys heard about that. But. Yeah, I, I, actually, uh, I, I, I actually bought them. <laughs> you did you? Okay, good. Yeah, I Big plan, so. couldn't stand it anymore. They were out in Vegas for so long. We don't have anything like that here in the Midwest. So I went ahead and bought uh, Cirque, Cirque de Soleil. We're going to move them out in the middle of a cornfield and put up one of those <laughs> one of those Jesus come to meeting evangel evangelical tent tops and, and have them perform there. Cool. It's going to be awesome. That'll, that'll be cool. Yeah. They can do a little fishing during their downtime, stuff like that. It'll be fun. You really know how to ruin the world, don't you, Rich? I'm just saying, we need entertainment <laughs> out here in, in, the, in the Midwest as well. That's all I'm saying. Everybody always goes to, they think Midwest. Okay, we'll go to Chicago, we'll go to Indianapolis. No, 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 no. Come to a cornfield near me. That's all I'm saying. 
I get nothing for that. I don't, I don't know if you can hold your breath on that one. Yeah, I know. I, it, it'll never happen. That's I why I hope you can. <laughs> that's why we. <laughs> That's why we do shows like this, so we can have great entertainment in the middle of a cornfield. Never thought it would happen, but it did. And that's what we're going to do today as well. We have our guest panelists joining us today. Our guest panelists first joined MSI back in November of last year. And we're happy to have him back on with us today. Mr. Paul Hurst is here with us. He's a musician and producer. He's working currently with the guys over at G4 Software on Oddity 2. If you'll remember, last time he was on with us, uh, he actually gave us a sneak peek debut of Oddity 2 so we could hear what it sounded like before it was ever released, before anybody heard it. We heard it here first on MSI. So let's welcome him back, Mr. Paul Hurst. Paul, how are you, sir? Glad to have you back with us. I'm very good. Thank you for having me. It's great to see you again. I know that uh, you've been a busy guy because, you know, we, we actually try and get people to come on the show a lot, and you're busy. We understand that, but we're glad you took time out of your schedule to come back with us. How have things been going since we last had you on the broadcast with us? Um, it's been going great, as, um, certainly as far as the, the Oddity Lodge was concerned. It was um, received very well. Um, it's been getting, like, just brilliant reviews that we certainly had hoped for and um my contribution on it as far as i know it was received quite well i've had a lot of good feedback from the patches and things that i submitted um and basically i just carried on working away with it these last few months again creating more sounds for it so we can um, eventually put them up on the website and give them away to the registered users now, I think that's a great thing to do, and uh, I know that from uh, last time you were on the broadcast when we heard uh, some of the audio samples and the audio sounds in Oddity 2, they just kind of blew everybody away here at MSI, especially me. I'm, I'm an old uh, keyboardist anyway from back in the 80s, and uh, you know I remember going to uh, symposiums and conferences and things like that when MIDI had first made it big, and everybody's talking MIDI, and you're hearing MIDI strings for the first time and going gaga over them, or at least I did. And to listen to some of these sounds now, just literally night and day difference. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm similar sort of um, era of synth player originally. I mean, that's when I kind of started with my first synthesizers in the in the eighties. So sort of just as analog was coming to its sort of end, I suppose, and when, as you said, the, the MIDI sort of phenomena started, um, which initially frightened the life out of me, and I, oh, I, I didn't take kindly to it at first at all. I thought it was some sort of evil, this, this MIDI lark, and until I actually started to encompass it and got an understanding of what it was going to be able to do for keyboards and the way you could link all the equipment together much more seamlessly and easier than like the old um, CV gates and all that kind of thing we had to do with analog synths. Um, I was very wary of it, but I, I mean, and after using it and starting to play live with it regularly, and now it is still used throughout the system I use today, I, I don't know where we'd be without it, to be honest. Now, did you, uh, you said uh, at the beginning, MIDI kind of uh, scared you. Were you one of those guys who, uh, I guess you, you were, were more interested in, uh, from, from what you just said, it seems like you were more interested in the ability to control other synthesizers, not necessarily the sounds MIDI could reproduce or help reproduce, but basically controlling other synthesizers in that, in that aspect of what MIDI provided. What it initially was with, with with the MIDI for me is that I, as with any new sort of technology, I I didn't fully understand what it did, um, and I had a preconception of what it was doing that I didn't like, or as I said, you know, that was my position. I thought I didn't like what it was doing. It seemed to me that whenever I went into, for example, I'd, I'd go into a music shop and want to demo a keyboard, and they'd have all the latest sort of range of digital synths, which was. A lot of it was larger Yamaha stuff like DX7s and things. And it it never seemed to me that the synth that you were playing was the synth that was making the noise. 
and you were like changing patches thinking that's supposed to be like a, a saxophone sound yet you're getting a choir and i'm thinking well, what's going on here where's that coming from and it was only when you realized that that the linking them together allowed you to you know sort of press one patch on one synth and it would maybe change those patches on um, a whole arsenal of other synths so that they were ready for that particular song that's what i didn't understand it wasn't so much to do with um what was making the sound or how it was going to make the sound on that particular synthesizer it was just what was going on when i pressed the key no no i got you that makes sense uh, you know one of the things like i said that kind of really got a hold of me was uh the ability to to go through and actually modify sounds themselves and uh it, that was really kind of interesting to me to be able to take and tweak the the way a sound was reproduced. And, uh, you know, so you could take stock sounds, make them sound totally different. It's something that uh, was very difficult to do with a lot of the synthesizers I was working with, and MIDI just changed it. It was night and day kind of uh, mm. ability well, I mean, to do that. I mean, we, we always had the ability to change the sound the synth was making, you know, even right. on an analog synth. You know, you had all the knobs and sliders and things and to adjust it. I think what um, what um, the MIDI system brought along is, is, is along with it, obviously, came the digital synthesizer, mm -hmm. which allowed patch storage, uh, you know, beyond any comprehension we'd had before on an analog synth. And you literally, at, at a flick of a button, you had, uh, you had a harpsichord, you had a string section, you had brass, you had, you know, all sorts of... Uh, ethnic sounds and things that we've maybe not really had at our fingertips before without the ability and knowledge of knowing how to program them all. Um, I mean, yes, digital synths still allowed you the freedom, as you say, to change the patch and the sound, but it was tended to be quite a laborious process of scrolling through menus and menus, changing data, you know, number after number. Um, and that, I think, took a lot of getting used to and a lot of people didn't like it either, you know, which is kind of how this analog backlash, I think, sort of came about again, sort of towards the uh, well, sort of late 80s and mid 90s, really, didn't it? Analog since became very sort of desirable again. Yeah, now, I know that uh, I guess I want to move forward in time a little bit now uh, to, you know, the last year or so. You've been working with G4 Software on Oddity 2. You've been uh, doing a lot of beta testing, a lot of work on that. As I said, uh, you know, you, you showed us and, and we heard some sounds of it before anybody else did. Very appreciative of that because it sounds amazing. Um, are you still working in, in that area with G4 Software? What are you up to now and, and what's going on with yourself? Well, at the moment, um, after the launch of the Oddity 2, it was basically um, one. It was it was it was a relief that I managed to get done what I was asked to do because I, as I said, I submitted um, two banks of patches, um, and it was just nice to sort of get that done and get it released. And as I said, you know, hear sort of nice things about it, and then sort of post that, I was then asked by um, Chris and Dave at GeForce. Um, if I would submit um, three further banks for their software synthesizers, one being the Oddity, which is what I've been working on first. Um, and they also want me to do two um, banks for their Mini Monster, the Minimo uh, emulation that they do, um, and the Imposca 2, which is the, um, the Oscar emulation that they do. So I've got three batches of sounds that will eventually be coming available on their website that's pretty amazing I, now how how much work actually goes into doing a uh, uh, a number of sounds like what you're doing for for g-force i've always been curious about that it it really depends um i mean s some patches you know you can just sit there and you just come up with something in you know 30 seconds just literally it can just be an idea you have something will happen you'll twiddle something and you'll think well oh, i like where that's going um other sounds i can spend hours just sort of tweaking things messing things around and thinking i want to be able to try and get this you, you sort of like the, the way i go about programming is 
I either have an idea in my head that I'm thinking, right, this is the kind of sound that I want to, to create, and you go about trying to do that. Or sometimes you'll be playing around and the synth will kind of almost ask you a sort of a question about itself, and you'll be sort of persuaded along the way by the parameters of the synth. Um, and for instance, you know, many a time I've sat down and thought, right, I'm going to make, um, let's say, a trumpet sound. And you end up coming up with the furthest thing away from the trumpet you've ever heard because it just suddenly takes you on a different path. It's a, it's a, like a mutual inspiration kind of thing where you each, in kind, I, I guess if you can inspire a synthesizer, it can definitely inspire you as well. Very much so. And also the, the, the different um, sort of parameters on each different synth as well because offers like a, a, a different personality from each synthesizer. So you you almost interacting with them in a very personal way. Um, and you know what, to some extent, each of one of them can do. Um, and you're either just sort of either trying to play around with that or trying to, as I've certainly done with this latest batch of oddity, oddity ones, is I've literally tried to push it to the nth degree thinking, will it be able to do this? Can I make it do that? And what if this happens, will it do that? Um, so it's taken it a million miles away further than the actual original Odyssey could do because of all the new parameters they added onto this Odyssey 2. But it's really interesting to, even on some of the simpler patches, just to hear, for instance, what um, a polyphonic Odyssey would have sounded like doing, say, a simple string pad or something. Now, is um, it possible that we can hear some of these patches that you're putting together right now? Certainly, now, yeah. Um, now, before I ask, before I ask you to do that, however, I do have a question from the chat room. Uh, Pinky's wanting to know: Do you start when you when you create your patches? Do you start with digital samples or tone generators? How how do you start out? No, the, the, there's no sampling involved at all. Um, I mean, the basic sort of layout of of the Odyssey Two is. Um, just pretty much what the original analog Odyssey synthesizer was that this is modeled on. Um, however, what GeForce have done with this one is they've added um, a whole section which um, largely comprises of multi LFOs and ADSR envelopes that you can then assign to virtually any of the parameters that you see on the fascia of the keyboard. So. Whereas the original synthesizer, for instance, had had one LFO which would control uh, either vibratos or um, sample and hold rates and things like that, you now you're not confined to that one. You can literally select one and have different speeds or settings for every single one. Um, and what I generally tend to do is I just, as 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 I sort of said earlier on, is is I either just start with a set idea that I'm thinking I'm going to go out and make a trumpet sound. Or I'll be having some other crazy idea in my head thinking I've got this sort of evolving sound where I'd like it to have sort of, say, like a sort of a high pad sound in the background with an undercone of um, some sort of synthy bass sound going on. Um, and it's just it's just a discovery. I mean, it's it, it's obviously you've got to have some knowledge of, of, of what you're trying to do to make it do it. Right, right. But, but a lot of it is... Um, I was going to say trial and error. It makes it sound as yeah. if it is just a complete fluke, but it, it's, it's not a fluke, but it, but a lot of it can just be it, searching in the dark for something and then it well, appears. Yeah, well, let's hear something. Uh, let's hear some of the stuff you've done. Okay, then. Right. So these these are all from the bank that will hopefully um, appear on the on the website. Um, but we're, we're hoping to get these sort of available sort of um, mid-end of May. Okay. Okay. Um, I was um, trying to get these to the guys by tomorrow because I'm just about finished everything up now. So as soon as I get them to them, they've got to do all the various different versions that they do for, um, you know, Apple Macs and PCs and all right. sorts of things. So it'll take about a week for them to get sorted out. Um, but anyway, let's start with the number and we'll start with patch number one, uh, which I've called Random Resonances. Now, this is quite a complex sound, which I'll play for now. Yell if it's too loud, and I'll turn it down. All right. So you can 
hear there that there's all um, resonances coming from the, the filter there, which we've got basically mapped to a sample and hold. Okay. And that creates that kind of musical... You know, the sort of almost like bell-like noises in the background. And, um, that's quite a nice one, I thought. Yeah, yeah, it is. Let, let's take a listen to one more before we actually get into reviewing some of the music. Yeah. One of the more very complex ones that I tried to do is I was um, saying we're trying to push it to the absolute nth degree sometimes. Um, I think this was the right one. At the moment, I've got a few at the end of the patches that I've literally just called either sequence one, sequence two, just to show that despite the synth not having an arpeggiator, which is um, a function on the keyboard that allows it to play sort of multiple notes by holding down simple chords, what I've managed to do is create arpeggiator-like sort of patterns just by, again, using the multi-LFOs and assigning them to the pitches. And I've done something I called um, instant JMJs, which is basically short for Jean-Michel Jarre. They sort of inspired these patterns. Um, have a listen to this one. All right. <laughs> As just going through different LFOs, right? Yeah, just, just randomly changing the pitches. We're sort of random it's sort of based like it. You, you select a different LFO for each oscillator, and then you can adjust the pitch of that one and the timings that it changes the pitch. And if you interact it with the second oscillator, at different pitches, it creates almost a musical event. Wow. I think from the comments I see in the chat room, I think you have a winner there. They they we like so. what they they <laughs> like what they hear very much. What what level of polyophony does the uh, synth need to have? Paul, sixty four or one hundred twenty eight? Endless. That's from Pinky in the chat room. Um, the, the polyphony on the the oddity literally can go from uh, one note. I think it's. I don't know, I'll just have to see if this goes up to sixty four. Oh, 32. 32 is the maximum polyphony the actual um, synth will allow. Um, I can't see that you're ever going to need 32 notes polyphony, other than if you had an extremely sort of long evolving string sound or something. Um, mm. But it's it, it's the performance of the keyboard is largely to do with the you know the power of your computer really as to how many voices you're going to get out of it. Um, but I must admit I've run the oddity on on my second computer, which is the sort of my day-to-day computer, which has very little um, processing power and it still handles it perfectly well. Uh, it's pretty amazing stuff you've got going on there, Paul. Uh, we'll have to make sure everybody looks for that at the end of May or around that time. Let's hope so, yeah. Got ourselves a lot of free patches. That's amazing. That sounds great, by the way. Mm-hmm. It is a Sounds it's, a, very it's nice. a glorious synthesizer. It, it really is. It. I mean, when when the lads first sort of talked about um, doing Oddity Two and saying they were going to do it polyphonic and that, I mean, that was my initial thrill. I thought, oh, it'd be great to be polyphonic. But then the the extra features they added, I'm just made it a, a monster synth. It's really beautiful. Uh, it certainly is, and uh, we definitely appreciate you taking time to show us a little bit of it and show us a little bit about what you're doing with some of the new patches because. Some amazing stuff going on there, in my opinion. Thank you very much. All right, now we do have some new music that we'd like to take a listen to on the broadcast today from artists, as I said at the top of the show, around the world who submit their stuff to us specifically for our panel to take and look at. So if everybody's ready to do that, let's get to song number one on the broadcast today. Here it is, everybody. Song number one on today's music scene investigation. Certainly hope you enjoy it. We'll be right back after song number one on today's MSI. Enjoy. This roof with me 
but what you said It would be such a shame If you should sleep That is song number one on the broadcast today. I want to bring everybody back in, get their thoughts on it. Going to start everything out with Ian first. Ian, what do you think about track number one? First thing that hit me was the, the uh, how extremely well that acoustic was recorded. That just sounded awesome. Really, really did sound nice. And the level of recording and production across this track is very, very good. Very, very slick. Uh, really sort of good take on sort of modern folk. We're just chatting that the fact that it's got some beatboxing in there in the in the chat room, which was great. It sounded good. I liked the way it picked up when the sort of howling sort of guitar or synth, whatever that was, came in. Um, vocals were nice, good harmonies. The one thing that didn't really sort of grab me was the uh, the song itself. There's some good lyrics going on there. Come jump off this roof and fly with me, things like that. But the hook wasn't that developed, and I didn't feel that there was a hook in there that grabbed me that made me want to sort of join it in any sort of way. Um, It's all very well done. I just think, you know, when you've got such a well-produced track, you need something a bit stronger to draw your your audience in. Um, 
yeah, I mean, not much else to say. I like the arrangement. The breakdown at the end, possibly a little bit unnecessary in places, just that uh, you could have shortened the song off a little bit, but it worked. I personally would like to hear it go back to the acoustic guitar, just to sort of keep in that sort of folk edge. But, you know, different people produce different ways, and it's horses to courses from that point of view. I like it. I think the song itself needs a development here. Not the production, not the mix. Everything else sounds great. Um, very, very balanced. But, you know, if you want to draw me in, then you're going to have to have a bit of a better hook than that. All right. Makes sense, Ian. I appreciate it. Andrea, your thoughts on track number one? I love this track. Um, I had the same, the same immediate response as Ian did to that guitar. Just stunning. So well recorded. Bright, clean, really well balanced. Uh, beautiful lows um, it's just perfectly done I mean it doesn't the recording doesn't get better than that it was so nice um, the vocal entry I thought was also really well done uh, gorgeous with that little light harmony in the back that comes in right away perfectly balanced again and um, immediately kind of draws you in like wow this is this is going to be something. And then it really continued to deliver that great entry with that vocal hi-hat hand over to the right and the, the, the vocal snare hand over to the left and kind of put in the back and right before those drums came in to kind of, you know, build it. Um, nice progression. The changes were beautiful too. Um, you know, overall everything I thought was great. I get the, you know, I get the concept here. Um, trying to do something that's a little bit more experimental and less structured. Um, and I think that people who tend to do things really, really well think like that sometimes, and that's what they wanted to make this. And I don't, honestly don't have any problem with it. I thought it was, um, it was gripping. I thought it was interesting. I can hear a whole lot of places that it would be useful in the real world um a lot of film and tv stuff i'm sure would love to get their hands on this this piece so man i love it i thought it was great in every way all right well i appreciate it andrea thank you over to mr paul hurst paul what do you think of track number one on today's show um well we've all said it i mean the guitars at the beginning that the stereo guitars were just beautiful you know as, as we've all said so well recorded nicely played um, none of that scratchiness or you know fret noise you get. It was it was really nice, um, very atmospheric track. Um, as Ian said, not a particularly hooky track, um, and for that reason, it's it's it certainly isn't a single, is it? it? It it's an album track, if anything that, and I think it needed developing further as well, rather than making it shorter. After that long period where um, I think what I think was it a violin solo. That's that was kind of my guess on it. It all went very sort of broke down in just those long sustained notes. Had it come back in again then and maybe gone round with the guitars again and left us with some sort of um, uh, like a resolution of a hook, um, it would have been perfect for me. But it, it is. It's um, it's either an album or it's it's one of those like opening live tracks, isn't it? Where you kind of draw the the audience into the band and thinking, oh, you know. These are very interesting. Where's this going to go? Um, um, I mean, it, genre-wise, it, what is that? Is it is it country? Is it folky and sort of uh, reflected on? Very nice, but um, just, yeah. Do I remember anything about it other than just the production? Good points. Good points all the way around. I appreciate your thoughts, Paul. Thank you very much. The name of track number one on today's broadcast it's called This Roof. It's by a group called Echoic, and we appreciate their sending that track into Music Scene Investigation. Told you at the top of the show, going to tell you again, you want your music in front of our panel, it's simple to do. Just go to musicsceneinvestigation.com, click on Submit a Song at the top of the page. That's all you have to do. You can send it in right from there. Two more tracks to listen to. Here is track number two on the broadcast right now. Enjoy it, everybody. This is track number two on today's music scene investigation. And we'll get to track number three right after track number two.
That's track number two on today's music scene investigation. Going back over to the panel right now, we'll start out with Andrea Benzmiller. Andrea, track number two, what are your thoughts on that one? Uh, okay, this one, the right away, my first, my first reaction was the mix is odd, <laughs> for, better, for a better word. Um, I just I thought the mix was so there was so much space in it it was so hard to even you know figure out where they were going with this everything being so distant um, so you know as it kind of went along it, it's it came out that it's more of like a 70s re, 70s retro feel thing um, everybody knows that the 70s music is not my favorite style of stuff so um so, you know, as it went, it really just felt like there wasn't a whole lot of uh, cohesion in this mix. Um, the vocal was really up front, very separated from everything else. Um, and then the guitars that came in later kind of, they came in and so, so suddenly and so loud, it kind of dominated everything all of a sudden. Um, as far as the song itself goes, it's a little rambly in, in form from you know from my point of view not a lot happening in the melody um not a lot of real difference between the verse and the the chorus hook and not a particularly strong lyric hook um in the chorus and um so i don't know i didn't have a whole lot of feeling about it it was just kind of going by with this mix that had all this space in it it was hard to really get a grip on any of the instruments in it. Um, and the other um, thing that I would say is probably important to um, the vocalists, the kind of singing done here, um, 
it's really a, a way that, that vocalists who've never explored their full voice or trained much sometimes do, where they sing everything in this very light head voice, even if they could do some of it in their chest voice with support. And because of that, it comes out kind of kind of weak and pitchy at times. There's not a lot of tone or not a lot of depth. And um, and it's too bad because it's not that she doesn't have a good voice, but it's not being used in a, any way that's striking. So um, so yeah, unfortunately, I thought this track had a lot of weaknesses in it. Um, so you know, there's some stuff to fix, maybe a rewrite, maybe a, some remixing. Definitely redo the vocal. Um, yeah. All right. I think I covered it. <laughs> I think you did. All right, Andrea. Thank you. Over to Mr. Paul Hurst. Paul, track number two, over to you, sir. Mm. Um, it's certainly, I think it could do with a, a remix. It's, um, I think what they've set out to do here is, is they've, they've tried to create this sort of intimate, dreamy soundscape. Um and they, they, they've just gone sort of um, too sort of laid back with everything. Like the, the drums and everything were so far back in the mix. Um, and what instrumentation there was, which was um, quite undetectable at times, whether it was just guitar and a bit of bit of synth bass appearing somewhere. There was certainly a synth snipped in there somewhere. Um, it... It needed almost to be slightly more, um, what's the word I'm looking for? I don't know, more dominant, more strident in the, the, the bass and the guitars and things to then have that little sweet sort of quiet voice. Then you'd, you'd need to mix it loudly, but it would need to be intimate and very close to you. And then you would be sort of much more into listening to what the, what the girl's sort of singing about. Um, I did also think that certainly towards the first bits, the, the vocals were a little bit out of tune and on some of the long notes, which at the very beginning you you really don't want to, you know, you've got to nail that that first bit of vocal, otherwise you're constantly sort of scrutinising it, thinking, well, is she going to be out of tune again? Is it going to be like it was before? Um, and it did get better. It was just, you know, out of tune notes at the beginning, not a good idea. Um, the guitars that came in in the middle eight, um, pan sort of extreme far right just didn't work at all. Um, again, I can I can see what it is that they were trying to do. They were trying to like pick up the pace and the emotion of it, but it was just it's just the wrong sound and uh, it just that bit didn't work for me at all. Um, it's a shame because I think you know that there's there's potential there with, with, the, with the girls singing and um, and the, the way that the song could have. Um, sort of came across much better had it just been produced slightly better. All right. Well, I appreciate your thoughts, Paul. Thank you very much. Over to Ian. Ian, track number one, or track number two, over to you. Yeah, I'm going to... Uh, we're running a bit late today, so I'm going to keep it nice and concise. I mean, the, the Andrea and Paul have covered most of it. The mix is all over, all over the place. The panning, you've got an organ hard left, you've got those guitars hard right. Uh, the, the whole mix is flat and dull and lacks any life. Wrong use of reverbs. The reverbs are too big in places and, and not giving anything any solidity. It's, it's too ambient, it's, it's too much going on and it's making all the sounds swamp into each other. Um, the vocalist, uh, she is flat in places and she's really lacking any sort of conviction uh, or confidence in her singing. I, I, I'm gonna guess that she's produced this herself, that she's had no one sat behind her going, nope, you need to do that take again. Um, and she's sort of settled for what she thinks is her best. And I think she needs someone behind her, pushing her to do more. She's obviously got a voice. It's not that she can't sing. It's just that, you know, what's been done has been done, and it's been left at that. She needs someone sitting there pushing her. Uh, she needs to sort of, you know, the lyric free running, when it's sung like that, doesn't sound very free or very running. To be honest, it sounds like a slow walk. Um, so you need to capture that. You know, if you're singing about free running, you need to have some confidence and some conviction in what you're singing about and make it sound like people want to free run and want to be free and want to be out there sort of doing their thing. 
Lyrically, again, didn't catch me um, too much. It was, as Andrea said, sort of verse chorus was pretty much the same. Uh, and it really does need taking back the drawing board, uh, a bit of a rewrite and a totally new recording uh, with a lot more life in that mix. And some timing issues on the acoustic guitars and stuff as well need, need ironing up. All right. Thank you, Ian. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. And uh, song number two, as you heard it right here, it's called... Free running, it's by Rabbit Foot Capers. We appreciate Rabbit Foot Capers sending that track into music scene investigation. As Ian mentioned, we are running a little long today, so we're going to get right to song number three right now. Here it is, everybody. This is track number three on today's music scene investigation. Certainly hope you enjoy this one as well. That's track number three on the broadcast today. As we head back over to our panel, we're going to start with Mr. Paul Hurst this time around. Paul, track number three over to you this time. What do you think? Um, good question. I don't know. I'm just looking at my notes, and it says track three, and that's it. It stops after that. Um, and I don't know whether it was a lack of interest or, or what it was, but it was... There was nothing that I could particularly um, fault about it. Nothing particularly interested me in it. It just sounded um, 
very dated um, in their song structure and style uh, and the recording style. Um, and, well, I'll, I'll save us time and just say it didn't do anything for me at all, really. All right, short, sweet, straight to the point. I appreciate it. Thank you, Paul. Over to Ian Husbands. Ian, track number three to you. Okay, um, mix-wise, to start with, this is everything sitting in the mid-frequencies. There is no clarity in the highs. There is no clarity in the lows. The bass is not sticking out from the rest of it. It's just a bit of a mud down the bottom. That goes for the kick drum and for the bass, bass guitar. Uh, uh, the cymbals are all very sort of... Uh, boxy and, and sound like they're sort of there's, there's just no clarity in the tops and the cymbals and things like that. Uh, the vocal is is pushed sort of into the mix rather than slightly on top of the mix, so you can't actually make out what she's saying. And her her vocal sound is very boxy again. Need some clarity on the on the highs there to sort of bring her out that mix and have her sort of sort of stand up. Um, I don't know. Song-wise, it, it didn't really grab me, to be honest. Uh, it's, it's a bit cliche um, and was lacking in dynamic, um, especially when that chorus came in. I wanted to hear I wanted to hear a big overdriven guitar sitting underneath just to lift that chorus. I wanted to hear some harmonies really sort of flooding in to sort of pick that chorus up and make the parts stand, up, stand, up, stand out from each other. You know, it's typically sort of based around a, quite a sort of common rock and roll country, bluesy feel. Nothing new in the in the progressions or the core patterns that are being used. Um, you know, it sounds like there's some accomplished musicians on there. It sounds like everyone can at least play relatively well. There were some timing issues with the drums, especially when they, when they first came in. But I mean, again, that can be fixed if you know if you really are struggling. That can be fixed in um, production. But you know, try and get it right the first time. Try and get it right live. Um, yeah. It's just all sitting in the midst for me, and there's no clarity in this mix. It needs taking back and re-recording. And I, from an arrangement point of view, I would seek to make those choruses a bit more punchy with a bit of overdriven guitar, more layered vocals. Um, solo was nice at the end. I'll give them that. That was good. Um, but, yeah, it didn't really grab me as a song either. All right, Ian, thank you. And now over to Andrea. Andrea, you have the last say this round about the song we just heard, song number three. What do you think? Um, I, all, everything that Ian said about the mix, I'm going to say the same, so I won't rehash that. Um, everything that Paul said about the song, exactly. And then other than that, I had pretty much written exactly the same thing as I did for, for number two. Um, this song, so old fashioned in every way. It's, it's like the ultimate non-professional demo of a really old, like, you know, I, it's almost like I wonder, did the band get back together and decide, you know, we used to play in the 70s and let's get back together again and record again because it's just so, it's almost from another planet. It's so dis, disjointed from what's been happening in the last 20 years. Um, it's vocally, it's sung that way. It's kind of a, again, the same thing with the vocal. No, everything in head voice, super light, way too much vibrato, um, very, very show, show tuny voice esque, um, and then kind of put over this, this song with not a whole lot of melodic or lyrical strength. So, um, you know, I don't know. I, I hate, I hate to discourage people, and I hate to be the kind of person who says, you know, maybe this just isn't your thing, <laughs> but. It feels like that to me. This piece of music has absolutely no purpose to me. I don't. I don't see how it's going to grab anybody. I don't see anybody interested in this kind of music anymore. And it's not done well enough to feel like, oh yeah, this could be a revival, <laughs> you know. Um, which, believe me, if there can be a revival of anything, I'm totally on your side. But um, but not like this. Not done this way. It just doesn't have anything. To, to me to offer so all right well there you go all right andrea thank you that song number one you did or song number three it's called mascara girl it's by sandra coffee sandra we appreciate your sending that song in to music scene investigation 
As we always do every week, we have our panel select a song of the week as well. That's what we're going to have them do right now. So discuss it amongst yourselves. I'm going to turn everything over to you and let you make that selection. Not much discussion needed from my point of view this week. I'm going to go straight in at number one, Rich. Ditto. Yep, track one for me as well. All right. Well, there you go. Easy peasy, as they say on the television commercials I watch. I only watch one television commercial, and that's all they say, but that's okay. Echoic with This Roof is unanimously selected as Song of the Week. Paul, I want to thank you for joining us on the broadcast again. And uh, again, tremendous, tremendous sounds that you're creating there. Cheers. Thank you for having me again. Uh, we're pleased as punch that you joined us. Certainly hope we can get you back on with us again real soon, a lot sooner than seven months. <laughs> yeah, give me a shout. <laughs> Definitely will. Andrea, Ian, thank you. Thank you to everybody in the chat room as well. Again, if you want to join us live every Sunday, 4 p.m. Eastern time, I do believe based upon what I'm seeing over there, I've been watching periodically throughout the show how our video stream is doing. It's up and down, up and down, as I said. I think we're going to do audio only starting next week. We'll still post a video. We just will not be playing it back live. The video will still be recorded live and available on YouTube, the website, iTunes, and so forth and so on. So you'll still be able to see us if you're inclined. You'll be able to hear us live, as always, at musicsceneinvestigation.com slash live, where we'll find it. And uh, please rate us over there on YouTube and uh, iTunes. We'd appreciate that as well. Thanks for being with us, everybody. We're going to play out right now with our song of the week, This Roof by Echoic on Music Scene Investigation. Thanks for being here. See you again next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. To this roof with me, but watch your step. It would be such a shame if you should sleep.
Come jump off this roof with me and fly away. Hold on and rely on me. We'll be okay.